The story so far. In 1975, Ed Roberts invented the Altair personal computer. It was a pain to use until 19-year-old pre-billionaire Bill Gates wrote the first personal computer language. Still, the public didn't care. Then two young hackers, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, built the Apple computer to impress their friends. We were all impressed, and Apple was a stunning success. By 1980, the PC market was worth a billion dollars. Now, view on. We are nerds. Most of the people in the industry were young because the guys who had any real experience were too smart to get involved in all these crazy little machines. It really wasn't that we were going to build billion dollar businesses. We were having a good time. I thought this was the most fun you could possibly have with your clothes on. When the personal computer was invented more than 20 years ago, it was just that, an invention. It wasn't a business. These were hobbyists who built these machines and wrote this software to have fun. But that has really changed. And now this is a business. This is a big business. Power Center! <laughs> It just goes to show you that people can be bought. So if you're really an exciting on Thank you. I want to see a blue more on waters. If they got that. How the personal computer industry grew from zero to 100 million units is an amazing story. And it wasn't just those early funky companies of nerds and hackers like Apple that made it happen. Most of this transformation from hobby to big business can be linked to three letters. I B M. IBM was and is an American business phenomenon. Over 60 years, Tom Watson and his son, Tom Jr., built what their workers called Big Blue into the top computer company in the world. But IBM made mainframe computers for large companies, not personal computers, at least not yet. For the PC to be taken seriously by big business, the nerds of Silicon Valley had to meet the suits of corporate America. IBM never fired anyone, requiring only undying loyalty to the company and a strict dress code. IBM hired conservative hard workers straight from school. Few IBMers were at the summer of love. Their turn-ons were giant mainframes and corporate responsibility. They worked nine to five and on Saturdays washed the car. This is Intergalactic HQ for IBM, the largest computer company in the world. But in many ways, IBM is really more a country than it is a company. It has hundreds of thousands of citizens, it has a bureaucracy, it has an entire culture. Everything, in fact, but an army. Okay, Sam, we're ready to visit IBM country. Obviously, we're dressed for the part. Now, when you were in sales training in 1959 for IBM, did you sing company songs? Absolutely. Well. Just to get us in the mood, let's sing one right here. You're I have kidding. the uh, have the IBM, the songs of the IBM, and we're going to try for number seventy-four. Our IBM salesman sung to the tune of Jingle Bells. IBM, happy men, smiling all the way. Oh, what fun it is to sell our products night and day. IBM, Watson men, partners of TJ. In his service to mankind, that's why we are so gay. Now, gay didn't mean what it means today, then. <laughs> Remember that. Right. Okay? Okay, let's okay. go. I guess it was okay. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> when I started at IBM, uh, there was a dress code uh, that was an informal oral code of white shirts. You couldn't wear anything but a white shirt, generally with a starch collar. Uh, I remember attending my first class and a gentleman said to me as we were entering 
the building, are you an IBMer? And I said, yes. He had a three-piece suit on, vests were of the, of the Vogue. And he said, could you just lift your pants leg, please? I said, what? And before I knew it, he had lifted my pants leg and he said, you're not wearing any garters. I said, what? He said, your socks, they're not pulled tight to the top. You need garters. And uh, sure enough, I had to go get garters. IBM is like Switzerland, conservative, a little dull, yet prosperous. It has committees to verify each decision. The safety net is so big that it's hard to make a bad decision or any decision at all. At which we announced a new organizational structure. Rich Seidner, computer programmer and wannabe Paul Simon, spent 25 years marching in step at IBM. He feels better now. I mean, it's like getting 400,000 people to agree what they want to have for lunch. You know, I mean, it's just not going to, it's going to be lowest common than, you know, it's going to be, you know, hot dogs and beans. So, um, so what are you going to do? Uh, so IBM had created this process and it absolutely made sure that quality would be preserved throughout the process, that you actually were doing what you set out to do and what you thought the customer wanted. At one point, somebody kind of looked at the process to see, well, you know, what's it doing and what's the overhead built into it? And what they found is that it would take at least nine months to ship an empty box. By the late 70s, even IBM had begun to notice the explosive growth of personal computer companies like Apple. The Apple II, small, inexpensive, simple to use. The first computer... What's more, it was a computer business they didn't control. In 1980, IBM decided they wanted a piece of this action. There were suddenly tens of thousands of people buying machines of that class and they loved them and they were very happy with them and they were showing up in the engineering departments of our clients uh, as machines that were brought in because you can't do the job on your mainframe kind of thing. JB wanted to know why I'm doing better than all the other managers. It's no secret I have an Apple. Sure there's a big computer three flights down but it won't test my options, do my charts or edit my reports like my Apple. The people who'd gotten it were religious fanatics about them. So the concern was we were losing the hearts and minds. And give me a machine to win back the hearts and minds. In business, as in comedy, timing is everything. And time looked like it might be running out for an IBM PC. I'm visiting the IBMer who took up the challenge. In August 1979, as IBM's top management met to discuss their PC crisis, Bill Lowe ran a small lab in Boca Raton, Florida. Hello, Bob. Hey, Bill. Nice Good to, to see, see you again. Hey. Yeah, I tried to uh, match the IBM dress code. How did that's, I do? That's terrific. That's terrific. I'm sorry. He knew the company was in a quandary. Wait another year, and the PC industry would be too big even for IBM to take on. Chairman Frank Carey turned to the department heads and said, Help! He kind of said, well, what should we do? And, uh, and I said, well, we think we know what we would like to do if we were going to proceed with our own product. And he said, no. He said, uh, at IBM, it would take uh, four years and 300 people to do anything. I mean, that, it, it's just a fact of life. And I said, no, sir, uh, we can provide you a product in a year. And he abruptly ended the meeting. He said, you're on, Lowe. Come back in two weeks and tell me what you need. An IBM product in a year? Ridiculous. Down in the basement, Bill still yeah. has the plan. To save time, yeah, instead of building a computer from scratch, yeah. well, they would buy components the off the shelf here. and assemble yeah. them. In the what in yeah. IBM <laughs> speak was called yeah. open yeah. architecture. Right. Um, IBM never did this. Two weeks later, Bill proposed his heresy to the chairman. And frankly, this is it. Now, the key decisions were to uh, go with an open architecture. Uh, non-IBM technology, non-IBM software, non-IBM sales, and non-IBM service. And we probably spent a full half of the presentation carrying the corporate management committee into this concept mm -hmm. because this was a new concept for IBM at that point in time. Was it a hard sell? Um, Mr. Carey bought it and as a result of uh, of him buying it, uh, we got through it. With I the backing of the chairman, Bill and his team then set out to break all the IBM rules and go for a record. Yeah, we'll put it in the IBM section. 
Once IBM had decided to do a personal computer, and to do it in a year, they couldn't really design anything. They just had to slap it together. So that's what we'll do. You have a central processing unit, and uh, let's see. You need a, a monitor or display and a keyboard. OK, a PC, except it's not. There's something missing. Time for the Cringely Crash Course in Elementary Computing. A PC is a box full of electronic switches, a piece of hardware. It's useless until you tell it what to do. It requires a program of instructions. That's software. Every PC requires at least two essential bits of software in order to work at all. First, it requires a computer language. That's what you type in to give instructions to the computer, to tell it what to do. Remember, it was a computer language called BASIC that Paul Allen and Bill Gates adapted to the Altair, the first PC. The other bit of software that's required is called an operating system. That's the internal traffic cop that tells the computer itself how the keyboard is connected to the screen or how to store files on a floppy disk instead of just losing them when you turn off the PC at the end of the day. Operating systems tend to have boring, unfriendly names like Unix and CPM and, and MS-DOS, but though they may be boring, it's an operating system that made Bill Gates the richest man in the world. And the story of how that came about is, well, pretty interesting. So the contest begins. Who would IBM buy their software from? Let's meet the two contenders. The late Gary Kildall, then age 39, a computer science PhD, and a 24-year-old Harvard dropout, Bill Gates. By the time IBM came calling in 1980, Bill Gates and his small company, Microsoft, was the biggest supplier of computer languages in the fledgling PC industry. Many different computer manufacturers are making the CPM operating system standard on most models. For their operating system, though, the logical guy for the IBMers to see was Gary Kildall. He ran a company modestly called Intergalactic Digital Research. Gary had invented the PC's first operating system, called CPM. He'd already sold 600,000 of them, so he was the big cheese of operating systems. In the early 70s, uh, I had a need for an operating system myself, and uh, it just uh, it was a very natural thing to write, and it turns out other people had a need for an operating system like that. And so uh, it was a very natural thing. I wrote it for my own use, and then uh, started selling it. In Gary's mind, it was the dominant thing, and it would always be the dominant, because you know Bill did languages, and Gary did operating systems. And he really honestly believed that would never change. But what would change the balance of power in this young industry was the characters of the two protagonists. So I knew Gary back when he was an assistant professor at Monterey Post Grad School, and I was simply a grad student. Uh, and, and went down, sat in his hot tub, uh, smoked dope with him, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it all, uh, and commiserated and talked nerd stuff. He liked playing with gadgets, just like Waz did and does, just like I did and do. He wasn't really interested in, in, in how you drive the business. He, he worked on projects, things that interest him. He didn't go rushing off to the patent office and patent CPM and patent every line of code he could. He didn't try to just squeeze the last dollar out of it. Gary was not a, uh, a fighter. Gary avoided conflict. Gary hated conflict. Bill, I don't think anyone could say, backed away from conflict. Nobody said future billionaires have to be nice guys. Here at the Microsoft Museum is a shrine to Bill's legacy. Bill Gates hardly fought his way up from the gutter. Raised in a prosperous Seattle household, his mother was a homemaker who did charity work, his father a successful lawyer. But beneath the affluence and comfort of a perfect American family, a competitive spirit ran deep. I ended up spending the Memorial Day weekend with him out on his, uh, his grandmother's house on Hood Canal. She, she turned everything into a game. Uh, it was a very, very, very competitive environment. And if you, if you spent the weekend there, you were part of the competition. And it didn't matter whether it was hearts or pickleball or swimming to the dock. Or, and you know, and there, was, there was always a reward for winning and there was always a penalty for losing. One time was funny. I, I went to um, to Bill's house, and he really wanted to show me 
his, his jigsaw puzzle that he was working on. And he really wanted to talk about how like he did this jigsaw puzzle in like four minutes. And like on the box it says if you're a genius then you would do the jigsaw puzzle in like seven. And um, he was into it. He's like, you know, I can do it. And I said, no, you know, I believe you. You don't need to break it up and do it for me. You know. <laughs> Bill Gates can be so focused that the small things in life get overlooked. If he was busy, he didn't bathe. He didn't change clothes. We were in New York, and the demo that we had crashed the evening before the uh, announcement. And Bill worked all night with some other engineers to fix it. Well, it didn't occur to him to take 10 minutes for a shower after that just didn't occur to him that that was important. And he badly needed a shower that day. <laughs> the scene is set. In California, laid-back Gary Kildall, already making the best-selling PC operating system, CPM. In Seattle, Bill Gates, maker of BASIC, the best-selling PC language, but always prepared to seize an opportunity. So IBM had to choose one of these guys to write the operating system for its new personal computer. One would hit the jackpot, the other would be forgotten, a footnote in the history of the personal computer. And it all starts with a telephone call to an eighth floor office in that building, the headquarters of Microsoft in 1980. At about, uh, oh, about noon, I guess, I called Bill Gates uh, on Monday and said I would like to come out and talk to him about uh, his products. Bill said, well, how's next week? And they said, we're on an airplane, we're leaving in an hour, we'd like to be there tomorrow. Well, hallelujah, right on. Steve Ballmer was a Harvard roommate of Gates. He had just joined Microsoft and would end up its third billionaire. Back then, he was the only guy in the company with business training. Both Ballmer and Gates instantly saw the importance of the IBM visit. And Bill said, Steve, you better come to the meeting. You're the only other guy here who can wear a suit. So we figured, okay, the two of us will put on suits, we'll put on suits, and we'll go to this, this meeting. We got there roughly 2 o'clock. And uh, we were waiting in the front, and uh, this young fellow came out to, to take us back to Mr. Gates' office. I thought he was the office boy. And, it, of course, it was Bill. He was quite decisive. We, uh, we popped out the non-disclosure agreement, the letter that said that he wouldn't tell anybody we were there and that we wouldn't hear any secrets and so forth. He signed it immediately. Now, IBM didn't make it easy. You had to sign all these funny agreements that sort of said I, IBM could do whatever they wanted whenever they wanted and use your secrets however they, they felt. But so it took a little bit of faith. Jack Sams was looking for a package from Microsoft containing both the basic computer language and an operating system. But IBM hadn't done their homework. They thought we had an operating system. Because we had this soft card product that had CPM on it, they thought we could license some CPM for this new personal computer they told us they wanted to do. And we said, well, no, we're, we're not in that business. And when we discovered we didn't have the, he didn't have the rights to do that, and that it was not, he said, but I think it's ready. I think Gary's got it ready to go. <clears throat> I said, well. No, but no time like the present, call up Gary. So Bill, right there with them in the room, called Gary Kildall, Digital Research, said, Gary, I'm sending some guys down. They're going to be on the phone. Treat them right. They're important guys. The men from IBM came to this Victorian house in Pacific Grove, California, headquarters of Digital Research, headed by Gary and Dorothy Kildall. Just imagine what it's like having IBM come to visit. It's like having the Queen drop by for tea. It's like having the Pope come by looking for advice. It's like a visit from God himself. And what did Gary and Dorothy do? They sent them away. And Gary was, he had some other plans, and so he said, well, uh, Dorothy will see you. And uh, so we went down, the three of us. IBM showed up with an IBM non-disclosure, and, and Dorothy made what I, what, a decision which I think it's easy in retrospect to say was dumb. Well, we popped out our letter that said, uh, uh, please don't tell anybody we're here, and we don't want to hear anything confidential. And uh, she read it, and she said, I can't sign this. She did what her job was. She got the lawyer to look at the non-disclosure. The lawyer, uh, Jerry Davis, who's still in Monterey, uh, threw up on this uh, non-disclosure, it was uncomfortable for IBM, they weren't used to being waiting, and, and, and it was an unfortunate situation. Here you are in a tiny Victorian house that's overrun with people and chaotic. And So we spent the whole day in Pacific Grove debating with 
them and with our attorneys and her attorneys and everybody else about whether or not she could um, even talk to us about talking to us. And we left. This is the moment digital research dropped the ball. IBM, distinctly unimpressed with their reception, went back to Microsoft. Bill Gates isn't the man to give a rival a second chance. He saw the opportunity of a lifetime. Digital research didn't seize that, and we knew it was essential. If somebody didn't do it, the project was going to fall apart. So we just got carried away and said, look, we can't afford to lose the language business. That was the initial thought. We can't afford to have IBM not go forward. This is the most exciting thing that's going to happen in PCs. And we were already out on the limb because we had licensed them not only BASIC, but Fortran, COBOL, Assembler, uh, Typing Tutor, Adventure. I mean, basically, every, every product the company had, we had committed to do for IBM in a very short time frame. But there was a problem. IBM needed an operating system fast, and Microsoft didn't have one. What they did have was a stroke of luck, the ingredient everyone needs to be a billionaire. Unbelievably, the solution was just across town. Paul Allen, Gates' programming partner since high school, had found another operating system. There's a local company here in, in, uh, in Seattle called Seattle Computer Products, a guy named Tim Patterson, and he had done an operating system, very rudimentary operating system that was kind of like CPM. And we just told IBM, look, we'll go get this operating system from the small local company, we'll take care of it, we'll fix it up, and you can still do a PC. Tim Patterson's operating system, which saved the deal with IBM, was, well, adapted from Gary Kildall's CPM. So I took a CPM manual that I'd gotten from the retail computer store, $5 in 1976 or something, and uh, used that as the basis for uh, the, what the, what we, the application programming interface, the API for my operating system. And so uh, using these, these ideas that uh, came from different places, I started in April and it was about half time for four months I, uh, before I had my, my first working version. This is it. The operating system Tim Patterson wrote. He called it QDOS, the quick and dirty operating system. Microsoft and IBM called it PCDOS 1.0. And under any name, it looks an awful lot like CPM. On this computer here, I have running a PCDOS and CPM86. And frankly, it's very hard to tell the difference between the two. The command structures are the same, so are the directories. In fact, the only obvious external difference is the floppy drive is labeled A in PCDOS and C in CPM. Some difference, and yet one generated billions in revenue and the other disappeared. As usual in the PC business, the prize didn't go to the inventor, but to the exploiter of the invention. In this case, that wasn't Gary Kildall. It wasn't even Tim Patterson. There was still one problem. Tim Patterson worked for Seattle Computer Products, or SCP. They still owned the rights to QDOS, rights that Microsoft had to have. But then we went back and said to them, look, you know, we want to buy this thing. And SCP was, like most little companies, they, you know, always needed cash. And so that was when they went into the negotiation. And uh, so ended up working out a deal to, uh, uh, to buy the operating system uh, from him for, for, for whatever usage we, you know, we wanted for $50,000. Hey, let's pause there to savor an historic moment <laughs> for whatever usage we, you know, we wanted for $50,000. It had to be the deal of the century, if not the millennium. It was certainly the deal that made Bill Gates and Paul Allen multi-billionaires and allowed Paul Allen to buy toys like these, his own NBA basketball team and arena. Microsoft bought outright for $50,000 the operating system they needed and they turned around and licensed it to the world for up to $50 per PC. Think of it, 100 million personal computers running MS-DOS software funneling billions into Microsoft, a company that back then was 50 kids managed by a 25-year-old who needed to wash his hair. Nice work if you can get it, and Microsoft got it. There are no two places further apart in the USA than southeastern Florida and Washington State, where Microsoft is based. This, this is Florida, Boca Raton. And this building right here is where the IBM PC was developed. Here, the nerds from Seattle joined forces with the suits of corporate America. And in that first honeymoon year, they pulled off a fantastic achievement. After we got a package in the mail from the people down in Florida, 
As August 1981 approached, the deadline for the launch of the IBM Acorn, the PC industry held its breath. Supposedly, maybe at this very moment, uh, IBM is announcing their personal computer. We don't know that yet. In companies across America, software writers like Dan Bricklin, the creator of the first spreadsheet, waited with his staff for news of the announcement. Um, this is a moment of PC history. IBM Secrecy had codenamed the PC the Floridian Project. Everyone in the PC business knew IBM would change their world forever. They also knew that if their software was on the IBM PC, they would make fortunes. Note that the attached information and information is not to be disclosed prior to any public announcement. It's on the ticker. It's on the ticker? Okay, so now you can tell people. What we're watching are the first few seconds of a $100 billion industry. Years of thinking big. Today, IBM came up with something small. Computer. Big Blue is looking for a slice of Apple's market share. IBM like bits and bikes mean nothing. Try this work. Money. Now they're going to sell thousand-dollar computers to millions of customers. Piece of the pie. I have seen the future, said one analyst, and it computes. Today, an IBM computer has reached a personal space. Nobody was ever fired for buying IBM. Now companies could put PCs with a name they trusted on desks from Wall's End to Wall Street. What IBM said was, it's okay, corporate America, for you to now start buying and using PCs. And if it's okay for corporate America, it's got to be okay for everybody. Your own IBM personal computer. For all the hype, the IBM PC wasn't much better than what came before. So while the IBM name could create immense demand, it took a killer application to sustain it. The killer app for the IBM PC was yet another spreadsheet. Based on VisiCalc, but called Lotus123, its creators were the first of many to get rich on IBM's success. Within a year, Lotus was worth 150 million bucks. Wham, bam, thank you, IBM. It's time to rock, time for home. IBM had forecast sales of half a million computers by 1984. In those three years, they sold two million. Yeah. Euphoric, I guess is the right word. Everybody was uh, believed that, that, that they were not going to, at that point, uh, two million or three million, you know, they were now thinking in terms of 100 million. I mean, they were probably off the scale in the other direction. What did all this mean to Bill Gates, whose operating system, DOS, was at the heart of every IBM PC sold? Initially, not much because of the deal with IBM, but it did give him a vital bridgehead to other players in the PC marketplace, which meant trouble in the long run for Big Blue. The key to our, the structure of our deal was that IBM had no control of our, over our licensing to other people. And the lesson of the computer industry in mainframes was that uh, over time, people built compatible machines or clones, whatever term you want to use. And so really, the primary upside on the deal we have with IBM, because they had a fixed fee, uh, we got about $80,000, and we got some other money for some special work we did, uh, but no royalty from them. And that's the DOS in BASIC as well. And so we were hoping a lot of other people would come along and do compatible machines. There were other PCs that were sort of like the IBM PC, kind of like it, but IBM now had 50% market share and was defining what a PC meant. What the public wanted was IBM PCs. So to be successful, other manufacturers would have to build computers exactly like the IBM. They wanted to copy the IBM PC, to clone it. How could they do that legally? Well, welcome to the world of reverse engineering. This is what reverse engineering can get you if you do it right. Well, the thing about Texas... It's the modest Aspen, Colorado ski shack of Rod Canyon, one of the founders of Compaq, the company set up to compete head-on with the IBM PC. Back in 1982, Rod and three fellow engineers from Texas Instruments sketched out a computer design on a placemat at the House of Pies restaurant in Houston, Texas. 
they decided to manufacture and market a portable version of the IBM PC using the curious technique of reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is figuring out, after something's already been created, how it ticks, what makes it work, usually for the purpose of creating something that works the same way or at least does something like uh, the thing you're trying to reverse engineer. Here's how you clone a PC. IBM had made it easy to copy. The microprocessor was available off the shelf from Intel, and the other parts came from many sources. Only one part was IBM's alone, a vital chip that connected the hardware with the software. Called the ROM BIOS, this was IBM's own design, protected by copyright and by Big Blue's army of lawyers. Compaq had to somehow copy the chip without breaking the law. First, you have to uh, decide how the ROM works. So what we had to do was have an engineer sit down with that code and through trial and error, we'd write a specification that said, here's how the BIOS ROM needs to work. It couldn't be close. It had to be exact. So there was a lot of detail testing that went on. You test how that all-important chip behaves and make a list of what it has to do. Now it's time to meet my lawyer, Claude. I've examined the internals of the ROM BIOS and written this book of specifications. Now I need some help because I've done as much as I can do and you need to explain what's next. Well, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the book of specifications myself, but the first thing I can tell you, Robert, is that you're out of it now. You, you are contaminated. You are dirty. You've seen the product that's uh, the original work of authorship. You've seen the target product. So now from here on in, we're going to be working with people who are not dirty. We're going to be working with so-called virgins who are going to be operating in the clean room. I right? certainly don't qualify there. I, I imagine you don't. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to hire a group of engineers who have never seen the IBM ROM BIOS. They have never seen it. They've never operated it. They know nothing about it. Have you ever before attempted to disassemble, decompile, or to uh, in any way, shape, or form reverse engineer any IBM equipment? Oh, uh, no. Uh, have you ever tried to disassemble or... This is the Silicon Valley virginity test, and good virgins are hard to find. You understand that in the event that we discover that the information you're providing us is inaccurate, you're subject to discipline by the company, and that can include but not be limited to termination immediately. Do you understand that? Yes, I do. Okay. That, uh, After the virgins are deemed intact, they are forbidden contact with the outside world while they build a new chip, one that behaves exactly like the one in the specification. In Compaq's case, it took 15 senior programmers several months and cost $1 million to do the reverse engineering. In November 1982, Rod Canyon unveiled the result. What I've brought today is a compact portable computer. It's when Bill Murto, another compact founder, got a plug on a cable TV show, their selling point was clear, 100% IBM compatibility. It turns out that all major uh, and popular software runs on the IBM personal computer or the compact portable computer. That extends through all of the software for IBM. Uh, yes. It, it all works on the compact. It, 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 compact was an instant hit. In their first year, on the strength of being exactly like IBM, but a little cheaper, they sold 47,000 PCs. In our first year of sales, we, we set an American business record, I guess maybe a world business record. Our, our largest first year sales in history was $111 million. So Rod Canyon ends up in Aspen, famous for having the most expensive real estate in America. And I try not to look envious while Rod tells me which executive jet he plans to buy next. And finally he picked the, the Lear 31. Oh, really? You now that, that was a fun airplane. Oh, yeah. Poor Fire Big Man Blue. Suddenly, everybody was cashing in on IBM's success. The most obvious winner at first was Intel, maker of the PC's microprocessor chip. Intel was selling chips like hotcakes to clone makers and making them smaller, quicker, and cheaper. This was unheard of. What kind of an industry had Big Blue gotten themselves into? Things get less expensive every year. People aren't used to that in general. I mean, you buy a new car, you buy one now, four years later, go buy one, it costs more than the one you bought before. Here, this magical piece of an industry, you go buy one later, it costs less, and it does more. What a wonderful thing. But it causes some funny things to occur when you think about an industry, an industry where prices are coming down where you have to sell it and use it right now, because if you wait later, it's worth less. Where Compaq led, others soon followed. 
IBM was now facing dozens of rivals. Soon to be familiar names began to appear like Amstrad, AST, and Dell. It was getting spectacularly easy to build a clone. You could get everything off the shelf, including a guaranteed virgin ROM BIOS chip. Each new clone maker, free of IBM's big overhead, took another bite out of Big Blue's business. Well, they really hit with a vengeance in 85. The prices were going down on the uh, competitive products at about 30% every six months. A terror would be a good, uh, <laughs> a good phrase. Terror? Oh, of course. I mean, it was getting, I mean, we were able to sell a lot of products, but it was getting difficult to make money. And where did every clone maker buy his operating system? Microsoft, of course. By the mid 80s, it was boom time for Bill. The teenage entrepreneur had predicted a PC on every desk and in every home running Microsoft software. It was actually coming true. As Microsoft Mushroom, there was no way that Bill Gates could personally dominate thousands of employees. But that didn't stop him. He still had a need to be both industry titan and top programmer. So he had to come up with a whole new corporate culture for Microsoft. He had to find a way to satisfy both his adolescent need to dominate and his adult need to inspire. From the beginning, Microsoft recruited straight out of college. They chose people who had no experience of life in other companies. In time, they'd be called microsurfs. And so a lot of, of young, I, I say people, but mostly it was young men who just were out of school, saw him as this incredible uh, role model or, or a leader, almost a guru, I guess. And they could sit and spend hours with him. And, and uh, he valued their contributions. And, and there was just a wonderful camaraderie that seemed to exist between all these young men and Bill. And the strength that he has in this, and his will and his desire to be the best and to be the winner. And he is just a, like a cult leader, really. As the frenzied 80s came to a close, IBM reached a watershed. They had created an open PC architecture that anyone could copy. This was intentional, but IBM always thought their inside track would keep them ahead. Wrong. IBM's glacial pace and high overhead put them at a disadvantage to the leaner clone makers. Everything was turning into a nightmare as IBM lost its dominant market share. So in a big gamble, they staked their PC future to a new system, a new line of computers with proprietary closed hardware and their very own operating system. It was Second. war. Start planning for operating system two today. IBM planned to steal the market from Gates with a brand new operating system called, drum roll please, OS2. IBM would design OS2, yet they asked Microsoft to write the code. Why would Microsoft help create what was intended to be the instrument of their own destruction? Because Microsoft knew IBM was the source of their success and they would tolerate almost anything to stay close to Big Blue. It was just part of, as we used to call it at the time, riding the bear. You just had to try to stay on the bear's back, and the bear would twist and turn and try to buck you and throw you, but darn, we were gonna ride the bear because the bear was the biggest, the most important. You just had to be with the bear. Otherwise, you would be under the bear uh, in the computer industry, and IBM was the bear, and we were gonna ride the back of the bear. But it's easy for people to forget how pervasive IBM's influence over this industry was. When you talk to people who've come into the industry recently, there's no way you can get that into their, into their head. That was the environment. The relationship between IBM and Microsoft was always a culture clash. IBMers were buttoned-up organization men. Microsofties were obsessive hackers. With the development of OS2, the strains really began to show. In IBM, there's a religion in software that says you have to count k -locks, and a k -lock is a thousand line of code. How big a project is it? Oh, it's a 10 k -lock project. This is a 20 k locker, and uh, there's a 50 k locks. And IBM wanted to sort of make it the religion about how we, we got paid, how much money we made off OS2, how much they did. How many k locks did you do? And we kept trying to convince them, hey, if we have a developer who's got a good idea and he can get something done in 4K locks instead of 20K locks, should we make less money? Because he's made something smaller and faster, less clocks. Oh, K locks, K locks, that's the methodology. Yeah, anyway, it almost makes my, 
my back just crinkle up at the thought of the whole thing. When I took over in 89, there was an enormous amount of resources working on OS2, both in Microsoft and the IBM company. Bill Gates and I met on that several times. And we pretty quickly came to the conclusion together that that was not going to be a success the way it was being managed. Uh, it was also pretty clear that the negotiations and the contracts had given most of that control to Microsoft. It was no longer just a question of styles. There was now a clear conflict of business interest. OS2 was planned to undermine the clone market, where DOS was still Microsoft's major moneymaker. Microsoft was DOS. But Microsoft was helping develop the opposition? Bad idea. To keep DOS competitive, Gates had been pouring resources into a new program called Windows. It was designed to provide a nice, user-friendly facade to boring old DOS. Selling it was another job for shy, retiring Steve Ballmer. How much do you think this advanced operating environment is worth? Wait just one minute before you answer. Watch as Windows integrates Lotus 123 with Miami Vice. Now we can take this for all. Just as Bill Gates saw OS2 as a threat, IBM regarded Windows as another attempt by Microsoft to hold on to the operating system business. We created Windows in parallel. I, we kept saying to IBM, hey, Windows is the way to go, graphics is the way to go. Uh, and we got virtually everyone else enthused about Windows. So that was a, a divergence that we kept thinking we could get IBM to, to come around on. It was clear that IBM had a different vision of its relationship with Microsoft than Microsoft had of its vision with IBM. Is that Microsoft's fault? You know, maybe some, but IBM's not blameless there either. So I, I, don't, I don't view any of that as anything but just uh, poor business on IBM's part. Bill Gates is a very disciplined guy. He puts aside everything he wants to read and twice a year goes away for secluded reading weeks. The decisive moment in the Microsoft-IBM relationship came during just such a retreat. In front of a log fire, Bill concluded that it was no longer in Microsoft's long-term interest to blindly follow IBM. If Bill had to choose between OS2, IBM's new operating system, and Windows, he'd choose Windows. We said, ooh, IBM's probably not going to like this. This is going to threaten OS2. Now, we told them about it. Right away, we told them about it. But we still did it. They didn't like it. We told them about it. We told them about it. We offered to license it to them. We always thought the best thing to do is, is to try and combine IBM promoting the software with us uh, doing the engineering. And so it was only when they broke off communication and um, decided to go their own way that we thought, OK, we're, we're on our own. And, and that was definitely very, very scary. And we were in a major negotiation in early 1990, right before the Windows launch. We wanted to have IBM on stage with us to launch Windows 3.0, but they wouldn't do the kind of deal that would allow us to profit. It would allow them essentially to take over Windows from us. And we walked away from the deal. Switch to CD ROM. Jack Sams, who started IBM's relationship with Microsoft with that first call to Bill Gates in 1980, could only look on as the partnership disintegrated. Then they, uh, at that point, I think they agreed to disagree on the future progress of, uh, of OS2 and Windows. And internally, we were told, thou shalt not ship any more products on Windows. Um, and about that time, I got the opportunity to uh, take early retirement, so I did. Bill's decision by the fireplace ended the 10-year IBM-Microsoft partnership and turned IBM into an also-ran in the PC business. Did David beat Goliath? The Boca Raton, Florida birthplace of the IBM PC is deserted, a casualty of diminishing market share. Today, IBM is again what it was before, a profitable, dominant mainframe computer company. For a while, IBM dominated the PC market. They legitimized the PC business, created the standards most of us now use, and introduced the PC to the corporate world. 
But in the end, they lost out. Maybe it was to a faster, more flexible business culture. Or maybe they just threw it away. That's the view of a guy who's been competing with IBM for 20 years, Silicon Valley's most outspoken software billionaire, Larry Ellison. I think IBM made the single worst mistake in the history of enterprise on Earth. Which was? Which was the, the manufacturer, being, being the first manufacturer and distributor of the Microsoft Intel PC, which they mistakenly called the IBM PC. I mean, they were the first manufacturer and distributor of that, that technology. I mean, it's just simply astounding that they could uh, basically give a third of their market value to Intel and a third of their market value to Microsoft by accident. I mean, no one, you know, no one, those two companies today are worth uh, close to, you know, approaching $100 billion. I mean, not many of us get a chance to make a $100 billion mistake. As fast as IBM abandons its buildings, Microsoft builds new ones. In 1980, IBM was 3,000 times the size of Microsoft. Though still a smaller company, today Wall Street says Microsoft is worth more. Both have faced antitrust investigations about their monopoly positions. For years, IBM defined successful American corporate culture as a machine of ordered bureaucracy. Here in the corridors of Microsoft, it's a different style. It's personal. This company, in its drive, its hunger to succeed, is a reflection of one man, its founder, Bill Gates. Bill wanted to win. Incredible desire to win and to beat other people. At Microsoft, we, the whole idea was that we would put people under, you know. And unfortunately, uh, that's happened a lot. <laughs> Bill Gates is special. It, you wouldn't have had a Microsoft with, take a random other person like Gary Kildall. On the other hand, Bill Gates was also lucky. But Bill Gates knows that, unlike a lot of other people in the industry. And he's paranoid. Every morning he gets up and he doesn't feel secure. He feels nervous about this. They're trying hard. They're not relaxing. And that's why they're so successful. And um, I remember I was talking to Bill once, and I, I, um, I asked him what he feared. And um, he said that he feared growing old because, you know, once you're beyond 30, this, is, this was his belief at the time, you know, once you're beyond 30, you know, you're, you don't have as, as many good ideas anymore. It's like you're not as smart anymore. If you just slow down a little bit, uh, who knows who it'll be? Probably some company that may not even exist yet, but, uh, you know, someone else can come in and, and take the lead. I said, well, you know, you're going to age. It's going to happen. It's kind of inevitable. Well, what are you going to do about it? And he said, I'm just going to hire the smartest people, and I'm just going to surround myself with all these smart people, you know. And I thought that was kind of interesting. It was, it was almost, it was like he was like, oh, you know, I can't be immortal, but like maybe this is the second best and I can buy that, you know. <laughs> if you miss what's happening, then the same kind of thing that, that happened to IBM or many other companies could happen to Microsoft very easily. So no one's got a guaranteed position in the high technology business. And the more you think about, you know, how could we move faster? What could we do better? Are there good ideas out there that, uh, we should be going beyond. Uh, it's, it's important. And I wouldn't trade places with anyone, but uh, the reason I like my job so much is we have to constantly uh, stay, stay on top of those things. The Windows software system that ended the alliance between Microsoft and IBM pushed Gates past all his rivals. Microsoft had been working on the software for years, but it wasn't until 1990 that they finally came up with a version that not only worked properly, it blew their rivals away. And where did the idea for this software come from? Well, not from Microsoft, of course. It came from the hippies at Apple. Lights, camera, boot up. In 1984, they made a famous TV commercial. Apple had set out to create the first user-friendly PC, just as IBM and Microsoft were starting to make a machine for businesses. When the TV commercial aired, Apple launched the Macintosh. Secure from the pests of The computer and the commercial were aimed directly at IBM, which the kids in Cupertino thought of as Big Brother. But Apple had targeted the wrong people. It wasn't Big Brother they should have been worrying about. It was big Bill Gates. And shall talk themselves to death and 